We're going to look at verses 11 through 14, and then I'll begin reading here. The writer says, Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have, not, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who part, partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so the writer here, the writer of Hebrews, has been teaching his, uh, his readers about Jesus Christ, and he's been pointing out that Jesus is our high priest. And as we entered into chapter 5, he had reminded them of the calling and the qualifications of the Jewish high priest. And he had outlined four basic things. He had pointed out that the high priest was taken from among men, that God had appointed him, that the high priest uh, would understand or understood human weakness, and that he offered sacrifices on man's behalf. And so he's speaking concerning the qualifications of the Levitical priest and the high priest uh, especially. Now, the point he's been making here in chapter 5 is all of these qualifications were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He pointed out that he had been appointed by God to be the high priest, that he had been taken from among men, that he was fully human, which allowed him to understand human weakness. He pointed out that Jesus Messiah, uh, when you just look at the various scriptures that relate to our Messiah, Jesus Christ, that he was considered, if you look at Isaiah 53, for example, that he was considered worthless, that he was rejected, that he experienced physical and mental pain, that he personally understood sorrow, that he was a man that no one valued. And so he was taken from among men. He was very aware of human weakness and the things that, that we go through as human beings. Jesus was tempted like we, but he never sinned. You saw that in chapter 4 and verse 15. And so this revealed his uh, capacity to, to have compassion and sympathy for us. The high priest also offered sacrifice, and as, as high priest, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice. In Mark 10, he had said it like this in verse 45. He said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In chapter 10, verse 17 of the Gospel of John, he said, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay down. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, authority to take it up again. This command, he said, I received from my father. So he offered himself as a sacrifice. The high priest offered sacrifice on behalf of man's sin. Jesus, our high priest, offered himself on behalf of us to deal with our sin. Now, we were seeing this last time. Let me touch on it for just a moment. The question could be asked, well, how could Jesus Christ be the high priest, because the priests were taken from the, uh, the lineage of Aaron, who was a Levite. And so how could Jesus, who was from the tribe of Judah, how could he actually be a priest? Well, the answer he gave, and, and we'll look at that again. As a matter of fact, that's a, a theme we're going to see more than once here in Hebrews. Well, the answer is that his priesthood actually predates the Aaronic, what is called the Aaronic priesthood. Chapter 7 will give us more information, but he's already pointed out that Jesus is from a different order. He's from the order, it says, of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek, when you look in biblical history and all, lived in the time of Abraham. That would have been around 2,000 years before Christ. Moses' brother Aaron lived around 1500 B.C., 500 years later. So Jesus is able to be the priest because his order predates Aaron by 500 years. And so the high priest's role itself actually ended. It ended when Jesus was resurrected because Jewish temple sacrifices had ceased around 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. And then that means that the Jewish high priest after the order of Aaron is ceased. So in the case of this one Melchizedek, the Bible tells us that his priesthood is never spoken of ending. So Jesus' priesthood is actually predating the Aaronic priesthood, 
and is a never-ending priesthood, and that's the point that he's been making. Now, that's something that he wants to further educate us on, his readers. But he's, he's telling us at this time, he says, I can't speak as I want to. And this is because those that he's writing to, he says, have become dull of hearing. Your original eagerness to hear God's word, he's saying, has cooled down in verse 11. You, he says, have become distracted. You're no longer eager. And I have more to share about Melchizedek. But at this moment, you're just not interested. And so their lack of interest has caused great concern for him. He's in, in, in essence, he's saying, how can I give you further information concerning Melchizedek if you don't care? Your dullness to spiritual things restricts your ability to receive and to understand. You're not mixing the word of God with faith. You're simply hearing it, but you're not understanding it. You're not seeking. You're not desiring to dig deeper and all. And he says, and that's greatly concerning to me. And that's what he said in verse 11. He says, we have much to say, hard to explain. It's not easy. Growing in spiritual understanding is not easy. A lot of people seem to think that it is, but it's not. I had somebody many years ago who was part of our fellowship at that time, and, and he, he said to me, you know, he said, I was given the opportunity to give a Bible study recently. He said, so I had to prepare it, and he said, as I was preparing the study and putting all the time and effort into it, he said, I came to realize something, that it's not as easy as it looks. He said, and you do that several times a week. And I said, yeah, putting together a Bible study is not as easy as it looks. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of digging. It takes an awful lot. And, and if you, but if you want to grow in the things of the Lord, it requires that. It requires that. There are people who get up, perhaps even in our church, I don't know too many who do, but who get up real early to go and work out. And they're out there doing all the, that it takes to, to work out, and they're building the muscles and everything, and there's nothing wrong with that. Of course, but they put a lot of effort into that. Well, when you consider that it takes a lot of time and effort and even some pain, and you have to endure all those things in order to get what you're desiring, why would we think growing spiritually is easier? Why would we think it's a simple thing to do, as just as simple as just kind of sit down and think about God and say, God, would you please un 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 undo the top of my head and just drop some spiritual knowledge on me? I I because I, I want to watch the game this Friday, and... Anyway, um, so he says, <laughs> he said, and I want to develop this with you. Your dullness to spiritual things restricts your ability to receive and understand. Verse 12, 4, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk not solid food. Enough time, he's saying, has passed since you first heard and embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. Enough time has passed. Now, when we introduced the book of Hebrews, I mentioned to you that, that uh, the book was written somewhere between 60 and 70 A.D., and the reason we know it was written before 70 A.D. is the temple is not mentioned as being destroyed. And in 70 A.D., the Jewish temple was destroyed. So had it been destroyed in the book of Hebrews, that would have been mentioned. So the author is writing somewhere between 60 and 70 A.D. So that means enough time has passed for them to grow deeply in the things of the Lord. Some had, at this time who are hearing this could very well have had uh, about 30 years of walking with the Lord. So it's not as if they're novices. These are people, many of whom, if they began, and all, we see this in the book of Hebrews, but they began and were continuing to walk with the Lord, could have had a 30-year track record with Jesus Christ. Ask yourself this question, and I'll develop it with you. If you got a job, and you began to work that job for three years, you gain a lot of information and knowledge, a lot of experience. 
If I'm going to go to somebody to do some work, we'll say, on my, on my car, and uh, I'm interviewing the mechanic and all, and he says to me, oh, yeah, I've been at it for about three years now. I think I'm impressed by that. And I think, well, that's great. That's good. Three years is a long time. But if he tells me, I've been doing this for 30 years, I'm probably going to listen to him a little more. Why is that? Because 30 years of experience, if it's going in the right direction, he could say, I've been destroying cars for 30 years. No, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> but if he says, I've been working, success, my business is 30 years old, and we've seen a lot of success and progress, and you've heard of my business, 30 years is a long time. So ask yourself for a moment, how long have you been a believer? Just ask yourself. I'm not going to try and convict you or anything. Just ask yourself, you know, are you convicted? No, ask yourself. <laughs> because if you've been a Christian for a few years, that's one thing, right? If you've been a Christian for many years, that's another thing. These people have been Christians, some of them for 30 years years and that's why he would say to them what he's saying he said by this time you ought to be teachers you ought to understand you ought to know you ought to be aware you've been at it for a long time now with so many years passing by their understanding should have been fairly deep I need to point out, though, that he isn't saying that they should all be teachers because not all are gifted by the Holy Spirit to be a teacher. What he is saying is you've heard enough to be able to communicate the essentials of the gospel. You've heard enough to know the basics. But sadly, that's where many of you have remained. I was reading something that I decided to just plagiarize, pretend I thought of it, but I didn't kind of like Kamala, but in 2009, ooh, what a burn. Okay, and <laughs> in 2009, the Center for Biblical Engagement issued a report that concluded that people who read the Bible at least four days a week have lower odds of participating in certain behaviors. They, they have a 57% lower odds of getting drunk, 68% lower odds of having sex outside of marriage, 61% lower odds of viewing pornography, 74% lower odds of gambling. And so these are changes of behavior by just spending time in the Word, and that's what they discovered as they took this poll. So the fact is... If you spend time learning the Word of God, reading the Word of God, you're also going to be learning how to communicate the Word of God. So it's possible for all believers to share their faith if they listen carefully, if they're in the Word, listen carefully, and are simply open to share. That's what it requires. Because in Matthew 12, 34, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. So whatever you fill your heart with naturally comes out. It's just a natural thing. Whatever your heart is filled with, you just speak very easily about it. Uh, I, was in a, I was teaching a Bible study 40-some years ago now, and uh, it was in a, my, our little apartment Marie and I had in Roland Heights, and we had a, a handful of people who would show up, but this night it was packed. I was so blown away. We had about 10 people there. And, um, but amongst these 10 were uh, two young girls. They were teenagers. I'd say 15 years old or 16. It's hard to remember now. But I do know this. They were bored. And you, you can read people's faces. You know when people are bored. You just look over there, and they're just like, oh, you know. And, uh, and that was Marie. The others were worse. <laughs> they were even worse than she was. But... After the study, they were in the kitchen, and they were just talking with real energy and smiles. And, and I thought, what, what a transformation. In the study, they're just like, oh, man, get this over. But afterwards, they're drinking their soda, and they're just talking. And I thought, I'm wondering, what is it that they're so excited about? 
And they're talking with such energy about it and laughing. So I actually just kind of walked up and just, I wanted to eavesdrop, and I did. And they were talking about boyfriends. And it, it just hit me, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you like the most is what you talk easiest about. If you spend time in the Word, that's what you're going to talk about. And it's not like, oh, i got to memorize this because i got to impress somebody with my Bible knowledge. No, what it is is if that's where your heart is, then your words are going to demonstrate that. And so people sometimes say, well, I don't know how to communicate. No, what happens is you get into the Word, and the Word begins to come out of you, and it changes your life. According to the same study, reading the Bible at least four days a week also made it more likely for the average Christian to engage in evangelism as well as discipleship. So those who read or listen to the Bible at least four days a week have 407% higher odds of memorizing Scripture, 231% higher odds of discipling someone else, and 228% higher odds of sharing their faith with others. What happens is you begin to speak about what matters to you. That's what you do. And if you love the Lord and you love His Word, in your conversations, you're going to find that it's really quite easy to share about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, sharing with other people is a fruit of faith, as well as a love for those who don't know the Lord. Reading and studying gives you information that you need. And as you gain this information, it equips you. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Be ready, be prepared, and, and do so with respect for those that are asking or interested. When I was in the Army, I was, in, I was going somewhere with uh, two or three friends of mine, and we invited somebody. They, somebody invited somebody I'd never met before. And he and I were sitting talking, and uh, he was from a Jehovah's Witness background. And I, I said, now, you're a Jehovah's Witness? He goes, yeah. I said, what are you doing here? Because Jehovah's Witnesses don't serve in the military. So I said, what are you doing here? And he says, well, I backslid and enlisted. And I said, oh, <laughs> interesting. And so I didn't know anything about his belief system. And so he had some statements that he made to me that caused me to be interested to know a li at least a little bit more about them. And that's what actually provoked me to start reading more and to look more into uh, that kind of belief system and all of that. And so when you're not able to handle a question or to be able to, to answer that question, those are the things that instead of causing you to just keep your mouth quiet because, gosh, I don't know, but it should provoke you to grow in your understanding so you're prepared the next time. And that's what happened to me at a very early age in my walk with the Lord. And so I wanted to sanctify the Lord God in my heart. I wanted to be prepared to give a reason for the hope that lies within me. I wanted that, and that's what happened. So these people here have had time to grow, but many haven't. And that's why he's admonishing them. Notice again in verse 12 what he says. He says, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles. Now, first principles is a, a Greek word. I'm not going to pretend that I can pronounce it. But it's a Greek word that uh, literally translates that which comes first. That which comes first. First principles, that which comes first. And in language, he's saying ABCs. Your ABCs. So you should have a knowledge of the basics, the ABCs. Now, the oracles, when he speaks of the oracles of the Lord... The Old Testament laws of God are called oracles. When what these oracles did is they reveal the mind of God to man. That's what you find in Scripture. God is revealing his mind to us through the written word. And so he's saying to them, you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the first principles, the ABCs of the words of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. You're at the point that you're only able to understand the very simplest basic truths of the things of God. When he says in verse 12, you have come to need milk, that speaks of regression. You're actually moving backwards. 
He's saying this. You have returned to bottle feeding. You're not prog progressing in maturity. I, again, I was in the military for two years. I got out. I came home. My mom and my dad had not progressed a bit in their faith. Not a bit. My dad and mom got saved probably in January of uh, 1971. I went into the military in March of 71, and I was gone doing my time of service. I came home, and as I came home, I noticed dad hadn't changed much at all, and neither had my mom. And I was greatly concerned for him. As a matter of fact, I still remember talking to my dad. I went into, I was at his house. I went into the patio area of their home. And I actually, I know this will surprise you, but I actually cried with my dad. And I cried to him. And by the way, this crying stuff that you see with me, that's really, that's really new. I, I didn't cry. I just didn't. I just didn't, but I did then, and I cried for my dad, and I cried, and I said, Dad, you haven't grown a bit. I've been gone two years, and you haven't grown a bit in your faith in Jesus Christ. Two years. I said, we got to do something about that, and that's what led to me starting home Bible studies, because I thought if nobody else would do it, and they're not going somewhere, maybe I should until they find somebody who can teach them better than I. And so that's how I began teaching. And my mom and my dad were actually my first Bible students and remained so until the day that each one of them died. They never had another Bible teacher. They only had their son because I gave them my life and the word of God. And so he's saying, I'm concerned for you. It's not, it's, it's not enough that you can say one way or Jesus is Lord or... It's not enough. You've got to know things deeper than that. This world is an unbelieving world, and, and they don't want your emotional faith. They want to have reasons for belief. They want to know why it's reasonable to believe in this God whom you say took upon himself human form. And all you can do is talk about your praise service or, or the current event, or, but you can't give us any depth concerning the things of the Lord. And that concerns me, and that's a point he's making. You only know the ABCs. That's all you know. You need, he said, notice this, you need milk. The easily digested elements of faith. Milk represents the nutritional yet easily digested elements of faith. The basics. Now, when you read your Bible, you'll know this. Spiritually young and immature are given what is called the milk of the word. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, Paul said, I couldn't address you as spiritual, mature, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men, like the unsaved? And that's what he's saying. Spiritually young and immature only receive milk. But in verse 13, he says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. That's what Marie calls me, but for different reasons. <laughs> but anyway. Everyone who partakes only of milk. Notice this in verse 13, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Unskilled, what does that mean? That simply means inexperienced. He's saying a spiritual infant is not accustomed to the deeper truth of Scripture. His spiritual system needs to mature. And maturity comes over time and practice. So as they learn his word, they're going to grow in deeper personal experience with God. They come to desire God's word. Why? Because they come to value the word of God in their life. They actually understand that it brings spiritual nourishment to them. And so deeper understanding is what they're to have. And, and, and this understanding and this growth, 
Uh, growth actually is going to be receiving more revelation from the things of the Lord over, the, uh, the, over time, which the revelation and experience combined gives them wisdom. Now, I'll give you an example of this. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on that donkey's colt, do you remember the story when he entered in? His men didn't understand what was taking place. They didn't understand what was happening. Their understanding of what he was doing came after the event. In John 12, 16, it says, at first, his disciples didn't understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did, did they realize that, the things, that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. At first, they didn't understand. Not everything is understood as you're going through it. It takes time and experience sometimes for the Lord to reveal the depth of what he's doing. Remember on the night, another example, on the night when, when Jesus was betrayed, remember how that he had girded himself with a towel, got a basin of water, and knelt and began to wash the feet of his men. And as he approached the apostle Peter, how that Peter at first refused him, didn't allow him to do so. It says in John 13, 6 and 7, he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Some things, when they're happening, you won't understand. So after washing their feet, he gave the explanation. He was saying, you should be servants. You should do even as I have done. That is the principle. That is what I'm teaching you. You're servants, and you need to do as I do. And so there are things that we experience that at first we may not understand. But later on, the Holy Spirit is going to unveil deeper insights to us. In John 14, verse 26, he said, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said to you. And so there will be times when you're doing something, may not understand exactly what's going on at that time, but the Lord will reveal that to you in a deeper way. And so these have not exercised. They haven't come to the deeper things of God. He said again in verse 13, everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word. They haven't grown in their experience. But verse 14 says, solid food belongs to those who are of full age. Speaking of spiritually mature, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Solid food. When, it's, when he begins by saying solid food belongs, literally he's saying, on the other hand, solid food is only for the more mature Christian. Solid food is, is like steak. The stake of the word, the meat of the word. I don't know about you, but you don't feed steaks to babies. Babies will get milk. So we, I, have to ask myself, what do I want? Do I want to be living on milk always? Or do I want to progress in my walk with God to be able to partake in something deeper? And so someone has to mature. How do you mature in the things of the Lord? Very simple. You practice what has been preached. You begin to do the things you're learning. Because hearing and obeying the word of God deepens your understanding. And in obeying the teaching, you gain experience through use of the knowledge. And what that does is it produces an internal understanding. It, it deepens your, your knowledge of God into a more personal, heightened level. At one point, you may say to yourself, I've heard that scripture and then later on, you'll say to yourself, I now understand that scripture. I've heard it, but I'm now understanding it. Now, there's a difference. And a lot of people memorize scriptures that they have no experience in yet. They're able to quote them, but they don't understand what they really mean or how deep it really goes. And so what happens is they learn. And as they learn, they obey. And as they obey the word, Jesus begins to reveal much more to them. That's a promise, by the way. If you take notes, John 14, 21. The one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and will reveal myself 
to him. So you know the word of God says to you, for example, um, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. You know that. You've heard it. You've read your Bible. You know that we're evangelists. We're all equipped to do works of service. And the reason we go to Bible studies is so that we may be fueled to continue in our progress and things of the Lord to share with the people what God wants to do in their life. We're all called to take the gospel out and share it. We know that. But sometimes we're a little nervous too, right? Sometimes we're, I don't know how, I'm, I'm afraid of doing that. I don't know how to do that. And so what happens, and this is what happened to me, is, uh, and I think it's common, um, is God puts you in a place where you need to share. You just, you just, you can't help, but you need to. And so you begin to speak. And you may share, it may be in a classroom, maybe a neighbor, maybe somebody that you encounter on the, on the job, whatever. But you begin to speak to them. And they'll ask questions. And, and sometimes when they've asked questions, especially in the early days of my walk with the Lord, they'd ask questions. And I'd go, wow, they're open. But I don't know how. But because I was part of a group called the Navigators and because we memorized scripture when I was in my early walk with the Lord, I found there were opportunities to use the scripture I just memorized. And so I would use the scripture. And then they look at you like you're some profound Einstein in the Bible, simply because they never read the Bible, and you do. And so they look at you like, and I've had them say, where'd you get that from? Where'd you get that from? I said, from the Bible? Really? Really? It says that? Yeah, it says that. I saw an interview, some of you guys know this guy, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan was talking to a believer, and the believer was sharing with him the gospel and was sharing something out of the book of Proverbs. And Rogan is an atheist. And as this guy was sharing with him some things, and the guy's a very basic Christian, like he's real fresh in his faith, he said, well, I was reading this, and he quoted out of Proverbs. And I'll, I'll never forget, and this wasn't that long ago, Rogan said, that's deep. Never heard that, right? You will be surprised how receptive people are to truth. You'll be surprised. So open your mouth and speak. And watch what the Lord, Lord does. Fill yourself with the things of God and watch him manifest himself to you, reveal himself in a deeper way. That's how uh, discernment, by the way, and understanding is developed. And it's part of your prayer life. Psalm 119, 30, 34, give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. I want to know your word so I may obey your word totally. And so here we go. The spiritually mature person values the word of God. So reading and hearing, believing and obeying, that becomes what you want to do. That becomes of premier importance. It reminds me of Job 23, 12. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Or Jeremiah 15, 16 your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I'm called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Your words are found, and I ate them. I digested them. I, I partook of and they went deep within me. And so if you desire to grow spiritually, what's the answer? Well, spend time in God's word and determine to obey that which he says. So the desire to know him is not simply an emotional faith. Sometimes I've heard people say, oh, I love the Lord, but it's almost like they're dating him. It's kind of like the Lord, and I don't mean this in, a, in, the, in the way it can sound, but it's almost as if they, they have a, a conception of loving God is almost a romantic thing, and it's not. Loving God is, is with your heart, soul, strength, your mind. It's with everything within you. It's, it's, it, it, God is the first and foremost and most premier important person in the entire universe. And everything from there kind of flows. That's your base. That's your foundation. That's the first thing you do in the morning. Early in the morning, I will seek you. The first thing you do in the morning is you seek the Lord. At the end of the day, you close your, your day with prayers and conversation with God. And you close your eyes and the next morning you do it again. And you do that every day for weeks and months and years and your life is transformed and people begin to see it. But it comes with a singular heart. It comes with a desire and a pursuit for that one thing. I want you. I want to have relationship with you. With my whole heart, I have sought you. 
Oh, let me not wander from your commandments, Psalm 119, verse 10 says. So we'll close in this way. Someone asks, okay, right, how do I become mature in my faith? How can I become one of full age? How can I? Um, Turn your Bibles with me to Proverbs chapter 2, please. Proverbs chapter 2. For those of you who may be new at turning your Bible somewhere and you say, where's Proverbs? It's in the Bible. (laughs) In the Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 2. I'm just going to touch on this very briefly. Verses 1 through 6. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Let me break that down for you for a moment here. We'll begin by first, he says, my son, notice, if you receive my words, receive If I'm going to become wise, experienced, grown in my maturity, I need to be open to instruction. I need to have a teachable heart, a teachable spirit. You'd be surprised how many people don't have that. You will be surprised. I've been lectured or I've been talked to by people who have just gotten saved to correct my understanding of things of the Lord. And I find that interesting. I like the zeal, but it's the zeal without knowledge. So the first thing you have to be is teachable, willing to receive. You see, the word receive there means to to choose, to accept. It means to take. And so if I'm going to grow, the soil of my heart has to be open to receive the seed of the word of God. So that requires humility and a hunger for God's truth. In Luke 10, 38 through 42, I'll read this to you. It it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, shut up. No. (laughs) No. Martha, Martha, you have worried. You are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Martha, you're busy trying to serve me. But Mary knows that in order to serve me, she needs to know me. Because there's hardly anything as worthless as trying to serve God when he didn't ask you to do that. So in order for me to, to, to do the best, I need to know what the need may be. I learned that as a married man when Marie and I first got married. I learned that early on. I went to a swap meet. It was Christmas. Man, you can buy a lot of stuff for a little bit of money in a swap meet. And so I found her all kinds of pants and, and, that, and that perfume. I got a, a gallon of it for like $2. It was amazing. And so it's Christmas. And I'm sitting there. It's the first time I'd ever gone Christmas shopping. And I'm, and I'm just watching my girl, you know, and thinking, ah. She's going to be excited, and she's looking at these orange pants, saying, that doesn't, you know, it just, and you know what I learned to do, husbands, if you haven't learned this, I think we all have, but I just send her out and say, get it yourself, (laughs) and I'll pay for it. 
That's wisdom from above. <laughs> no, I'll just go with her shopping. And just whatever you want, within reason, we'll get. What is it that I want? I want to know the Lord. I want to seek him. And Mary chose that part. Martha, you're busy and distracted by things I'm not asking of you. Mary is doing what needs to be done. She's at my feet learning so that she may be able to worship in spirit and truth. So how do we grow? One, we need to seek after his word. We need to search for it. Notice the second thing, we must value his word. We treasure it. When he speaks of treasuring the word of God, it simply means to be stored up. To treasure something is to, to hide it. Literally, it means to store it up. It speaks of memorization, really. It should be stored in our heart and carried about with us, ready to be called upon whenever we need. Psalm 119 Verse 11, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So it's something that's stored up within you. It's something that you seek, but it's something that is first you receive and it's something that you treasure. And then there's another thing that you do. Verse 2 tells us we incline. We incline our ear to wisdom and apply our heart to understanding. The word incline, it, it speaks of the practical habit of simply paying attention. Listening. One of the things the enemy has used, and he's using it very powerfully right now, is distraction. And we who are older have not the same, the same amount of distraction as our younger ones do. Our children who are caught up with their phones and all the little things that they can do now on their phone is a constant distraction. They're bombarded by a variety of messages that are capturing them. And so we think that the phone is their babysitter when, in fact, they're being captured by the world. And that's what's taking place. And so what we need to do is we need to incline. We need to have a practical habit of paying attention to the things that matter. Again, in the psalmist, he said, with my whole heart, I saw you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Psalm 119, verse 10. And so we incline our ear. We apply our heart. And then verse 3, a fourth thing is we cry out. For discernment, we lift up our voice. So with fervent desire, we say, God, illuminate your word. Psalm 119, once again, verse 18, open my eyes that I might see wondrous things from your law. Psalm 119, 130, the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Cry out for discernment. Lift up your voice. Four, verse 4, a fifth thing. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for a hidden treasure. You can read the word with other people. But searching the scripture is done alone. You can be seated in here as we read together. But it takes time on your own. Searching scripture is done alone. And it has a value. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 6.21 said where your treasure is your heart is also. You have what you want. If you want a deeper walk with the Lord, it requires you to ask him to open your eyes, to cry out to him, to have a hunger for these things, and to value it. The psalmist, again in Psalm 119, verse 72, the law of your, law of your mouth, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. You need to have a hunger for this treasure. It needs to be a premier thing in your heart. It, me it needs to be the thing that you value. If you want to grow. If you don't want to grow, don't listen. If you want to grow, pursue him daily. It's not once a week, twice a week. It's every day of the week. I, I, I have had a marriage now for a good while. And... I, I discovered at an early, early uh, stage of our marriage that if I wanted a good marriage, it's going to require a lot of work and time. And I've been encouraging her to put a lot of work and time in. <laughs> it's going to take a lot of work and time. I'm kind of tempted to tell you something, so I'm thinking about it. Let me say it. I'll say it briefly. Some of you don't know me, and I get it. 
I was teaching, I shared this recently, I was teaching somewhere, and I teased my wife. And a young man who came up to me afterwards said to me, would you pray about something? And I said, well, what is it? Would you pray about honoring your wife? And I looked at him, and I said, what do you mean? Would you just pray about honoring your wife? I said, how have I dishonored her? And so Marie's right there. And I said, just a second. And I turned to Marie. I said, honey, would you stand up, please? I said, am I dishonoring you when I tease you? She starts to laugh. She thinks I'm kidding. She goes, well, of course. I said, no, really, I'm serious. Am I dishonoring you when I tease you? She says, no, of course not. So I turned to him and I said, why would I pray about something that I don't need to pray about? I'm not dishonoring my wife. Well, you need to pray about it. I said, get out of here before I hurt you. No, I, I said, I'll put you on restriction. No, I, I said, no, no. So I'm going to explain something to you. From the time Marie and I dated, I discovered her sense of humor. And part of her sense of humor has been me teasing her. I've been teasing her forever. And that's my love language. That's how I tease. That's why you'll see me look down at her because I'm loving her. But it doesn't seem that way. Maybe if you don't know me, you may think, oh, he's humiliating his wife. No, I'm playing with her. I'm including her in what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. Just understand that. Because I, if somebody didn't understand it in a faraway land like Washington, <laughs> maybe somebody here thinks I'm dis <laughs> maybe somebody here thinks I'm dishonoring Marie. No, I would never do that. Anybody who knows me knows that. So I just thought I'd say that because, cause, you know, I just thought I should, just to keep things open and all. Ain't that right, baby girl? <laughs> Is it valuable to you? I'll close with a couple of thoughts. Is it valuable? Is the word of God valuable? Do you see the value of it? Is it a treasure that you would like? Are you willing to seek it with intensity Are you, because you know the reward is there? My pastor Chuck one time said something. I'll repeat here. He said, if you trust me, and he was talking to his fellowship, if you trust me, and, and I know you do, if I were to tell you that I know where the largest amount of gold that has yet to be discovered is, that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt where this large vein of gold is, and all I need from you is some help to dig it out. That's all I need. But I'm going to get up early in the morning. I'll be getting up at 3 because I have to drive a distance to get there. But when we get there, we're going to go into an area that I'm aware of, and we are going to dig out so much gold, you're not going to be able to contain it. He said to his church, how many of you would get up early, put on your work clothes, and go with me to get this gold. He said, I would wager all of you would if you trust me and believe me and know for a fact that I wouldn't lie to you, which I wouldn't. He said, and yet I say, get into the word of God early. And nobody wants to. And the reason is because you don't value it the way you value gold. And that's why we treasure God's word, because whatever effort it takes, the reward is worth it. The reward is worth it. That's why you get into his word. That's why you read it. That's why you'll begin to memorize it without you even realizing, because it sticks to your heart. That's why you pick up the book and you read it every day. And it reveals where your heart truly is, and your treasure in your heart are combined. And that's why he says, and we'll close with a couple of thoughts here in Proverbs 2. He said in verses 5 and 6, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord. You'll find the knowledge of God. You're going to receive direction. You're going to receive protection. You're going to have a personal depth. And this wisdom will protect your life. And God will produce a righteous man or righteous woman. You'll be protected by his wisdom. You're going to be wise to the the, the devices of the devil, you won't be ripped off by the world because it's the Lord, verse 6, who gives wisdom. It's the one who gives you knowledge and understanding. 
That's the origin of all wisdom. It comes from the Lord. And if you intensely search for it and pray for it, God gives it to you. James tells us if any of you lacks wisdom, ask of God who gives generously to all without finding fault. It will be given you. So, God, I want to. I want to know you. He says, if you truly call out uh, to insight, lift up your voice to understanding. If you seek it like silver, search Search it out like hidden treasure. Then you'll discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. And that's how you grow in the ability to discern good and evil. That's how you grow to understand and appreciate the beauty of the word of God. And that's how you are, you are matured to be able to embrace truth and reject that which is false. That gives you the ability to discern, he says, both good and evil. The devil has a way of presenting to us things that look good. They always appear good. He would never, he can't tempt you with something that you don't desire. He'll always give you a belief that what he's offering you is what you need. But the word of God tells you what you really need. And when you're in the word of God, you know how to avoid that which is not of the Lord and embrace that which is. And that's why it's such a blessing that you come out on a Wednesday night to get into the word with us. That's a blessing. It's a blessing to me to see you here. Would to God more people would be in midweek Bible studies in every church that teaches the word of God throughout this nation and throughout the world so that we would be equipped with works of service that we can be used by God to bring the glory of Jesus Christ to a lost world.